Good morning, Calvary and YouTube friends. Um, it is Sunday, March the 22nd, and happy Lord's Day to you. What unprecedented times we are living in. I am extremely humbled and extremely grateful to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for your flexibility. So many pastors I'm talking to, so many churches are trying to figure out how to keep loving on God's people and blessing God's people and, and uh, being good shepherds to God's people and your flexibility and the grace that you have extended during this time where we are dealing with this uh, coronavirus and, and when literally the entire globe, uh, all of God's creation is, is in a bit of an upheaval here. Uh, your, your grace, that the grace that you've extended has been fantastic and we are so thankful for you. To my CRCC friends, members of our church, Oh boy, we love you so much. And let me just say this right off the top before we get going into the message today, but we will get through this. We're going to be okay. You know, somebody has to tell you, you've been watching the news 24 seven, you know, you're probably ready to go curl up in a little ball somewhere, but let me tell you, our God is still our God. He is on his throne. He and Jesus Christ is risen. He is at the right hand of the father. He is Lord of all. And, uh, and as we'll be reminded, hopefully today, he is enough. Yes, even in 2020, just look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is enough. Amen. So thank you again for your faithfulness. Um, thank you all for you continuing to support the ministry, for looking out for your brothers and sisters, for your prayers, and for how people are calling and emailing and texting and checking on folk and just seeing the community, seeing the family come together. And certainly this is not just happening in our church, but it is happening in churches, the body of Christ really rallying to support one another across America. <clears throat> so thank you all so much for that. Uh, this morning, um, you know, we're in a series on reverence and uh, we looked at the holiness of God. We looked at fearing God. We looked at the love of God. And our heart for the month of March was to raise up our reverence, to be reminded again that our God is worthy of honor and glory and to raise up our reverence. Our key theme came from Hebrews chapter 12, where we were reminded that we are receiving this kingdom, this eternal kingdom, and, uh, and to be grateful for that, and that our God is a consuming fire, so he deserves to be worshiped acceptably or with reverence, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 20 and 29. And so we've been working on that. We wanted to uh, just walk with the Lord in a better way, in a, in a way more commensurate with his person, who he is and what he has done. Uh, of course, um, as things have progressed through the month of March, all of a sudden we find ourselves in a bit of a national, in a bit of a global crisis. And so my original plan this morning was to talk about prayer. And we probably will get to that at some point during the year, a message on prayer. But I found uh, myself thinking about what everyone's going through, the worry, the anxiety, and I went back into my notes um, from about 10 years ago, uh, 2008, 2009, when we were going through the financial crisis and we were writing uh, this book. Oh, that's probably backwards in your screen, isn't it? Uh, maybe not, but this book called Jesus is Enough. And, uh, and we were dealing with some of the same stuff. And, and really it was amazing that some of it, and I'll, I'll quote a little bit of some of the things we were working on then, but, uh, you know, the, our, the, the journey of our church is interesting. In, in mid-2000s, as we started working line by line through scripture, we started figuring out that um, many of the things that we felt were so essential and many of the things that we were, you know, spending our lives working towards didn't mean anything. Um, and, and the more we got them, the more unfulfilled we felt. And this is this was throughout the body of Christ in the West. I mean, money and status and cars and homes and those are all the breakthrough stuff. I mean, it just left us thirsty. And so as we went through the scriptures line by line, we started discovering that the goal of the scripture wasn't for us to get everything we wanted, but the heart of the Bible is for the Lord to be magnified, for Christ to be central in all things, and that He, having Him, He is enough. In fact, He's more than enough. And I remember 2005, 2006, 2007, learning that and preaching that, and people just hated it. I mean, they hated it. I was telling this to, uh, to Pastor Prophet yesterday. People just absolutely detested uh, the message that Christ was enough because they, you know, Christ is good, but can I get my BMW? You know, Christ is great, but can, can a brother get a, a house with more square footage? And I remember being called a, a 
preacher with no faith. And I mean, it was ridiculous. And then the financial crisis hit and all of a sudden it was wisdom. Oh, he is enough. Oh yeah, he is enough. Um, it's not about our houses. They're not worth anything right now anyway. It's not about our money. The stock market just crashed or went down significantly. He is enough, isn't he? It really is about Jesus. And then we got it for a while and then we kind of didn't again. And then here we are wondering what's going to happen with our money and with our health and with our country and with our world. Beloved, Jesus is enough. He still is. <laughs> We've been reminded again, as the Lord has shaken the foundations of everything, he's enough. So I submit to you that one of the mindsets that truly reverences God is a mindset that um, is rightly attuned to who he is and who we are and how those relationships interact. He is and we are not. That, and that he is enough. Uh, that his personhood, his work, his his atoning sacrifice. It's enough for us to have joy and peace and contentment even right now, March 2020. I want to jump into this with you this morning. Uh, I think it's a, an attitude that reverences God, and I want to pull up my notes for you uh, today so that we can kind of begin to talk it through. Uh, and so I, I pray that you, you get something out of this. This is a heart, it's a mindset that we have as a congregation. And so I truly pray that you uh, that you get something out of it. And oh, by the way, if you want a copy of the old Jesus is Enough book where we were working through this, uh, I'll give it to you for free. Just email me and I'll send you a PDF of it. No problem. I mean, I don't have that many copies left of it anyway. So I'll just send it to you and you and your family can start working through it. I think you'll be blessed by it. So as I said, our theme was Hebrews 12. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. So we started looking at his holiness and then we looked at the absolute need to fear God. And I, I, I've said this over and over. I'm going to keep saying it. A lot of the drama that we go through in our personal lives, would, in our work lives and so forth, would just disappear if we trembled before the Lord again. If we trembled before his word. And uh, when he speaks, we moved quickly. We didn't try to rationalize. We didn't try to justify. We moved quickly to obedience. Oh, just so much would just fall away. A lot of the counseling, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, depression, a lot of the, I mean, it would just, it would just tumble. It's such an important topic. If you missed that message, please take a listen. Then we looked uh, last week at how much our God loves us. And we traced it through the Bible even. Oh, how he loves his hard-headed people. What a great God we serve. Well, as I said, because of everything going on, instead of talking about prayer today and the kind of prayers that please him, uh, we'll eventually get to that. But you can probably guess what it is, right? Prayers offered in humility, prayers offered uh, in Jesus' name, prayers offered uh, with him as the center, center prayers offered uh, so that his will would be done, not our own. And then our humble petitions, willing to accept uh, what our sovereign God has decreed, you know, instead of the kind of praying where we're commanding God. We pray the kind of prayers where he commands us and we're grateful. So, but you, so you, that's a you know quick snapshot there. But um, I really feel like this mindset is also this mindset of Christ being enough for us, um, finding peace, joy, and contentment in him, recognizing that he's conquered death and that we, the lives we live, we live in him. And that's enough, um, more than enough, quite frankly. I think this mindset really honors God. So way back, in the mid 2000s, I know it sounds, it's not that far, but way back in the mid 2000s when our church first started walking through larger portions of scripture, as I mentioned, boy, it was life transforming. It got us into a lot of trouble, it still does, but it was so life transforming. And we made this discovery that Jesus is enough. We were working through Ephesians, we were working through Philippians, we were working through Colossians, we were working through large section of the gospels and man, it just, it just transformed everything. All of a sudden, you know, the American dream uh, was not as important as the kingdom dream. And that was a huge transition for us. And so in the book of the same name, quoting from the book, um, this is what we wrote. Many believers struggle to find meaning and fulfillment. And they navigate the waters of life, searching desperately for joy and peace. These believers desire to be successful in life, but do not feel like they have achieved anything. They are told that if they just wait long enough, a powerful blessing or breakthrough will come and their desires will be fulfilled. Have you ever noticed that the breakthrough never quite gets there? I mean, sometimes, but then we're so quick on to wanting the next one 
that it feels like nothing ever happened? When will Christ manifest this blessing, they wonder? Where has Christ gone? Our beloved Christ hasn't gone anywhere. He's just been overshadowed by what I jokingly call systematic blessing theology. If you never heard, heard me joke about that, that's the, the ability of, of modern preaching to turn any text, no matter what it is, into God's about to give you a blessing with your name on it, right? We can, we can do it to any text, no matter what the text is saying. And, uh, and it's sad, actually. Um, we want to preach Christ in all the scripture, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get some, some money with every, every text of scripture. So our inability to understand the simple truths of the gospel and our desire to bring business models into the church have also reduced our reliance on Christ. <laughs> There's a joke going around on Twitter right now. Uh, you know, since everybody's home, when, when I'm recording this, most people around the country are kind of home based on governmental ordinance and suggestion. Uh, there's a joke going around on Twitter that a lot of a lot of churches are are sending portable smoke machines home so everybody can feel like they worship. <laughs> it's just amazing. Uh, you know, so many of the things that we found so essential are all of a sudden mean zip to us, right? So that means they're not essential, are they? The means of grace are essential. Anyway, uh, right now business modeling in the church is failing, and you know that's another conversation for another day. But hmm, maybe maybe what God has said in the word is what we need. I mean, sometimes I had to ask myself, has the church lost its mind? I will just again keep in mind this was this was written nearly 10 years ago. Has the church lost its mind? Why are we telling people to focus so much on things that fade away? Now, if some of those things come as a result of contentment and hard work, wonderful. Ultimately, people should be taught that they come as a result of Christ's cross that he died to pay the penalty for our sin, not so that we can win in life. In other words, the Lord in his sovereign mercy often gives us wonderful things. He didn't have to, but he does. The most important thing that he gave us was our salvation. Jesus is enough to have joy. Jesus is enough to walk in peace and contentment. In Jesus, you can feel successful in life. Simply being faithful to him and his commands is success. That's so huge. Being faithful is success. Walking in faithfulness is success. Uh, walking in his principles uh, is success. Jesus is enough during difficult times. That was written a long time ago, and it's true right now in 2020. Jesus is enough to experience breakthrough because he is the breakthrough. There you go. Tweet that one, right? Put that one on Facebook. Jesus is the breakthrough. We need to get that mindset that says, Lord, we're praying that you end this virus, that you spare our lives. But if you don't, you are still worthy to be praised. And that's the difference between a maturing Christian and someone in the world who is, is dependent, it, it, their emotional state is dependent on things working out. We know that things have already worked out. They have already been worked out. And so everything now is just gravy. It's just us occupying till he comes. And our lives are in his hands. And that's the Jesus is enough mindset, a peace and a contentment that comes regardless of what's happening around us because Christ came, Christ suffered, Christ bled, Christ died, Christ rose again, Christ ascended, Christ is coming back. That's it. Everything else is just, you know, we would love perfect circumstances, but in the midst of not so per perfect circumstances, praise his great name. He's the breakthrough. Just look at somebody in your household, say he's the breakthrough right? Jesus is enough to adjust our perspective, freeing us daily from the temporary, temporal confines of this earth to live with eternal and unchanging realities. That's it right there, beloved. That's what we need right now. We need this perspective right now. Here we are in 2020, and the, this lesson, in my opinion, is just as appropriate now as it was when this book was written 10 some odd years ago. We were working on this, 15 really. Um, most of us are feeling as if we're facing unprecedented levels of, of, of uncertainty. Should say of. Watch me change this ghetto style right as we're talking. Praise God. <laughs> levels of uncertainty and insecurity, physically, financially, relationally, and emotionally. I mean, that's what we're feeling. I mean, I've never, have you ever lived through anything like this before? I've not. I mean, when 9-11 happened, it was, it was in DC, right? It was in New York. And the whole world felt it, the whole country felt it, but 
quite frankly, I wasn't in fear for my life or my children's lives in Chesapeake, Virginia. I mean, I, I wasn't. I was angry. I was sad about what happened. But I just wasn't. Well, this has affected everybody, regardless of so-called class, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of the amount of money you have. All of us now have to trust God, right? This has affected everyone. Our kids are home. We're all having to do different things than we've been doing before. And so it's these are unprecedented in my lifetime. Maybe World War II generation or Vietnam generation, but in my lifetime, this is these are unprecedented levels of of uh, uncertainty and insecurity in just about every way. And many, 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 many people are feeling that. And so I'd like to offer you today is a thought that Jesus is enough. This mindset to me gives honor and reverence to God because it is it puts all faith, all trust in His sovereign plan. And now here's the key, and develops contentment and peace in the midst of that, a serenity and a joy that comes with Christ being in control of our living and our dying. You know, the main, the main, we'll, we'll read it here in a moment, but the main verse, the, the key verse of the Jesus is another mindset is just that, that in Christ, bless, you know, in life, in him, bless his name, but in death, bless his name. You, we'll read that here momentarily. So the heart that prefers the death of self over self-preservation makes God smile. Lord, in all of these things, you're doing something in me where my flesh will die and more of you will live through me. That our consuming fire God loves sacrificial obedience and brokenness and an abandonment of worldly or carnal ideas. As I mentioned before, a lot of the things that seem so essential all of a sudden don't. In the ministry world, the church world, Maybe uh, at home, all of a sudden now, you know, the television programming or the, or whatever, just doesn't seem like it means that much. And um, I think some of that is God's doing. I think he's, he's helping us figure out what's important again. Um, that the closer we get to the Acts 5 mindset, exemplified here in these verses, you can see on your screen there, Acts 5, 41 through 42. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. In other words, this is the marvelous text in Acts 5, where the apostles were literally beaten for preaching in the name of Jesus. And they counted it, they counted themselves worthy to suffer, right? They were like, well, Lord, thank you for counting us worthy to suffer. I mean, that's, that mindset is so foreign from the Western experience currently. So the closer we get to that kind of a mindset, well, Lord, thank you for these times. Thank you for what you're teaching us during these times. Thank you, Father, that you're giving us the opportunity to trust you. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you reminded us again that you are pleased by faith. Thank you, Lord, that our, 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 our confidence ultimately is not in government or money or whatever, uh, as nice as those things might be, but our confidence and hope is in you alone, right? That mindset there is what we need. That's where our joy, our peace, our serenity, our contentment, our service comes from. The, and the closer we get to it, the better off we'll be. That's Jesus is enough. Think about it. <clears throat> when you die to yourself, when you die to your goals, your hopes, your dreams, I know this is blasphemy in modern leadership circles, but when you die to your, your goals, your hopes, and your dreams, you write them all down, you're very excited about them, then you submit them to God and go, okay, Lord, I mean, I've had to do that. Some of you've had to do that. This is what I'm asking you for, but not my will, thy will be done, right? When you can die to what you want, think about it. What can man then do to a dead saint? Dead in the sense of dead to my own desires and my own will and alive to Christ. Does a dead man or woman worry? When, you are, when, when you're trusting God for your very next breath, and if he grants it, you say, praise the Lord. When you're trusting God, for daily bread, and by the way, there's not much bread in the supermarket right now, right? So when you're trusting God for daily bread and he grants it and you say, bless the Lord, does a dead man worry? Does a dead woman worry? When I'm dead to, I'm dead to my life, dead to my dreams, dead to all of that, but alive to Christ, you know, where does, think about it, saints, where does anxiety come from? Does anxiety come from Christ not being in heaven? and ruling with all power and authority? No, he is in heaven, ruling with all power and authority. Does anxiety come from the Lord's lack of love for you? No, 
He loves you. We found that out. Does anxiety come from maybe this idea that God's not in control and he's up in heaven scrambling? What am I going to do? Nope. Ruling every celestial body and every subatomic particle in the universe right now under his authority. Anxiety comes from circumstances. It comes from the now. And the Jesus is enough mindset dies to the now more and more and, and shifts the perspective to be more eternal so that we can live like Christians uh, are supposed to live. I mean, here at the office, you can hear folk coming in and out. Praise God. Uh, but that's the mindset dead to ourselves and alive to Christ. And if you're dead to you and what you desire, and if you're just grateful for daily bread, because that's what we were instructed to pray for, then you're going to be okay. God forbid that I should glory, Paul says to the church at Galatia, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. I'm dead to it. I'm dead to the world. I'm dead to the world. The world's dead to me. I'm alive in Christ. Again, especially when they have been made alive in Christ. What an awesome mindset. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so I'm crucified now with Christ. I'm, I'm dead with my Lord, but I'm also alive with my Lord. and He lives in me. And so the rest of these things, whether good or bad, are filtered through the lens of that truth. And then there's your joy, there's your peace, there's your contentment, right? There's your ability to lift your hands, there's your ability to thank the Lord for daily provision, just daily bread. And that might mean the laying down of some goals and some things that you had set for yourself and so forth, but blessed be his name. So I'd like for us to consider that what I call the, the Jesus is enough text, the big, the big three, I believe. Um, there are many. But these are the ones that really had an impact on us many years ago. We'll, and we'll go through them uh, just for a few moments. The first one is found in Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Listen, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. <laughs> to live is Christ. So everything that we do is for him and through him to bless him. To die is gain. It's better to finish this life up and go ahead on and be with the Lord. And in fact, if you read on, you know, that's what you'll read. Uh, but it's better that we're here now for his own sovereign purposes. Uh, but ultimately, the best is to be in his presence forever. We have no more hurt and turmoil and pain and so forth. So our living is Jesus and our dying is gain in Jesus. That's the Jesus is enough mindset. Where's the anxiety coming from right now? Fear of death. That's where it's coming from. Let's talk about it. Fear of dying. Should a Christian fear death? The biblical answer is no. But of course, we're humans and it's understandable. But it's coming from suffering. It's the fear of suffering, the fear of loss, the fear of death, the fear of starvation, the fear of chemotherapy, the fear of cancer, the fear of, you know, for many of us parents, the fear that our children will suffer, right? So these, these things are normal and natural in human beings in a fallen world. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Christians, as we grow and mature, are supposed to have a different mindset about death because we serve the God who's conquered death and made it to lose its sting, right? So, you know, we, do we want people to die? No, we protect life. That's what we do. We certainly don't murder. Uh, but we go out of our way to protect life and to make sure we're healthy and all those things, right? Because we want to preserve the lives that God has given us. But should we fear the inevitable? No, not if we're in Christ. For to me, to live is Christ, do everything that he's commanded us to do in this life to our very best ability. But to die is gain. To shut my eyes and to go be with him is the, whew, bless your name, right? And that's not 
the mindset that we live with. And much of our anxiety is worrying about how we maintain our lives and, and, the, and the, the relative, I guess, abundance of, of those earthly lives. Remember, the Lord came, came to give us life more abundantly, but that's a spiritual promise, right? Faith and peace and joy and contentment, along with the daily things that we need. He didn't promise you an earthly mansion on a hill, right? It's a heavenly mansion that we're after. It's a heavenly mansion that we're after. So for me to live as Christ to die as gain, and this is what we need right now. This is the declaration. As much as I would love to look at the camera and say, you know, <laughs> the coronavirus is going to be gone in 24 hours, I can't do that. But I can say for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And so that strips away. In that declaration by faith, that strips away my fear of what's going to happen tomorrow. Because if worst case happens tomorrow and I don't make it, to die is gain. I pray I make it. I have children to raise I will, you know, and a wife to continue to watch with the word. But to die is gain. And so we've said it again many times. And this, uh, it, it's, you can read it there. It's not that Christ isn't ruling. It's that our eyes are on the earth. And it's normal. It's natural but we need to fight against those inclinations. From a Roman prison cell, Paul pins words that define the Christian life ethic, that our lives are hid with Christ in God. And he went on to write some of these words, they're beautiful, or all of these words, but these are some words that are beautiful. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Trash, you know, excrement, unmentionable things that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, that's, that's Paul's point. All these things I'm losing and, and count them as nothing that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So from jail, Paul is telling us to, be, to, to, to rejoice, but he's also telling us, giving us a perspective on earthly loss and this is hard for the Western Christian because our, our mindset paradigm for the last 50 years, 40 years has been built around better living. And we use the scriptures to run, you know, we use the scriptures to try to figure out how to have more in this life, more earthly abundance, more money, uh, more, you know, more, a, a better marriage and, and so forth. And, and some of those things are appropriate in context, right? Stewardship is a good thing when used for the kingdom of God. A better marriage is a good thing. It, it, it illustrates to the world Christ in the church. I mean, there, there's good things here. But if we're not careful and if Christ doesn't remain central, it just, become, it just becomes another form of prosperity heresy where it's just all about us and, and us. And, and that's why, you know, people don't feel like they've been to church unless somebody tells them how they can get their five blessings and their, and their three, you know, their three new whatever. And, you know, 18 messages on purpose when our purpose is clear in scripture. Fear God, keep his commandments. That's what we need right now. Fear God, keep his commandments. That's our purpose. That's what we do, right? But so often it's turned around into how we can have more money, ultimately, more comfort, more leisure, more luxury. Um, that's not Paul's mindset here. He's saying all that stuff. He had all that. He was wealthy. He had status, high-ranking Pharisee, et cetera, et cetera. Lost all that in a, in a prison cell talking about all that stuff meant nothing. I just want to know Jesus. He's enough for me. I just want to walk in the power of his resurrection. I want to learn more about him. I want to learn more about him through suffering that I may be more like him. That's what we need, believer. That's what we need. Yes, let's pray that the virus comes to a swift end for, for against loss of life, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely, let's do it every single day. But we need this mindset. We need to keep it. We need to fight for it. Our living is in Christ. Our dying is in Christ. 
Our good days are in Christ. Our bad days are in Christ. All things are in Christ. So let Christ be magnified in our living regardless. That's Jesus is enough. Taking each day and praising the sovereignty of our God because he ordained it so. In my living and in my dying, Christ. The next text is Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God, or on the right hand of God, and set your affection on the things above, not on things on the earth. Boy, do we need that one right now. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Again, does a dead man worry? Not when he's in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I love this portion of scripture. I fail at it every day, but I love it because it, I, I want it so bad. I want to walk in this so bad because here in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, is a, is a, a total absence of anxiety, right? It's, a, it's an acceptance of things that are going on, you know, with, of course, our attempts to preach the gospel and make disciples, but it is, it is just a serenity. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Our affection, that's where our hearts ought to be. Our love ought to be. Our desires ought to be. Why? Because we're dead to that stuff. We're dead to the earth. But we're alive in Christ. So this is, again, the Jesus is enough mindset. We have been commanded to seek heavenly things, desiring after the eternal. We've been commanded to set our affections, <laughs> our hearts on things above, not on earthly things. And it's difficult, very hard to do with a 24-hour news cycle, but that's the command. Think about the joy of a life increasingly unencumbered by worry and anxiety about money and food and status and what other people might think. For you pastors who may stumble on this, stop worrying about offerings and attendance and just focus on Christ. Boy, you'd sleep better at night, wouldn't you? For you parents, Keep teaching your children, keep discipling them. But ultimately, your strength comes from heaven, right? Uh, right now in the middle of all this craziness, where's our hope? Where it's always been? It's in Jesus. Remember this glorious truth. Christ is our life, not money, not houses, not government, not health. Christ is our life. He is our life. Um, and since this is so, I wrote here, you can rejoice. Have you been able to rejoice through this crisis? Have you been able to lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus, or has worry consumed you? I'll admit there's been a couple of days that I've been a little down. But oh, praise be to God for his mercy and his goodness. That Christ is my life, that Christ is your life if you've repented and believed. Hallelujah. One day we will be with him in glory. He's our life. He's coming back again, and we will appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. Now, the Lord knows we need earthly things. We're not bashing that. He told us that he'd provide those earthly things to us. He said that if we would you know, focus on his kingdom, the things that we need will be added unto us. And praise his name. We're to seek the kingdom. We're to seek the kingdom. Let him take care of the earthly, our hearts, our affections. If we are risen with Christ, our seeking should be above, should be above. Right now, everybody's seeking the earthly. It's understandable. I am too. I would like a sandwich, right? So can we get some bread in the supermarket? <laughs> I would like a pork chop. I mean, can we get some meat in the supermarket? So I'm no different. But I need to be able to take those rice and beans and say, thank you, Jesus for my daily bread. And ultimately the bread I really want is the one that came down from heaven and to be more like him and to be content and peaceful in him and to rejoice that my sins have been forgiven and that the righteousness of Christ has been laid to my account by faith. Okay, so let him be your focus. Let him be your focus. Seek him, seek the heavenly. Remember that you're dead in the life that you live, you live alive to him. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Remember, he's coming back again, and these things will ultimately pass. And then finally, um, 
Matthew 11, come unto me, all ye that labor and are of a heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, it's a lot that could be said here, but our rest is in him. Easy enough. We learned when we went over this text last year that come unto me is an imperative. It's a command. He's not saying if you feel like it. He's saying come. Why? Well, first, we need the encouragement. Um, secondly, because he loves his people and he wants us to cast our burdens upon him and rest. To give him our weariness and our burdens. Right now, we're caring if you, aren't we? We're worried about jobs. We're worried about our children's education. Many of our children are home. Many of the school systems have closed. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen monetarily with uh, economic policy and so forth. Uh, in the church world, we're trying to figure out, you know, meetings, just getting together and what will happen to the church. And I know I've, you know, will people fall away and what's going to happen, all this work. And somewhere in here, the enemy's working too. So, uh, and, and it's, a, it's an interesting season. And so I need to learn and you need to learn and we need to learn to rest in Jesus. I'm carrying around yokes that I can't change. And so I need to, to lay that stuff down and take his yoke upon me. Or rather, yeah, I said it right. Did I say that right? I did say that right. Take his yoke upon me and learn of him because he is meek and lowly in heart. Amen. And his yoke, apparently, according to the scriptures, is easy. And his burden is light and easy and light sound really good right about now. Really good. What is the yoke of Christ? Well, his perfect keeping of the law, his loving submission to the Father's will, his sacrifice and salvation, all those things and more. The yoke of Christ. He did for us what we could not do. Therefore, his yoke is easy on us and his burden is light. And so as we close, um, some trust in chariots, some in horses but we will remember the name of the Lord, our God. Government's doing his best. Pray for our president and Congress and governors and all that, <clears throat> all those wonderful folks, they're doing their best. Uh, we are doing our best in the church world. You are doing your best in your households, but ultimately our trust needs to be in the Lord who has conquered death, who has given us a finite number of years to live on this planet and to do so in Christ, to live in him, but also to die in him. Do I think we're going to all die? No, I think it's going to, we're going to get through this reasonably quickly as these things go according to human history. And we're going to be okay unless he returns and then we'll really be okay. But I think the mindset, the journey through this is really important. And I think the Lord is shaking some of the things that we, that have given us security and helping us to realign our trust again so that our trust is in him and not in and the things that so easily come and go, so easily, 28,000 Dow to 19,000 Dow, I mean, in a day, in two days, uh, you know, all of man's things will eventually crumble. Our trust is not in horses nor in chariots, but it must be in, in the Lord our God. And so let us keep our minds firmly fixed upon Christ, beloved. God and his sovereign mercy has allowed the shaking of our worldly foundations. And we've seen yet again, the futility of man's devices and structures and prayerfully the absolute need for God's provision. Teach that to your children. Let them know the Lord has us all. What a time to reset and restore our faith in him and to rebuild right foundations. It is Jesus who matters. He is enough because our lives are fleeting and we must understand that. James told us that in James four, he said, look, essentially, you're gonna say you're gonna go do this and do that. What do you know? Your life's a vapor, it's here and gone. It vanishes away. But you ought to say, if it be the Lord's will, we'll do this or that. It's him that matters. So let's take our, our, this opportunity to rebuild our thoughts, hearts, relationships, church lives, work lives and everything else upon the rock so that when the rains have descended and they have when the floods come and they have when the winds are blowing and they are when they beat upon that house the house still doesn't fall because it's built on the rock it's built on something that doesn't change or spoil or fade away 
And so as you teach this to your children, as you are reminded yourself, a couple of questions, how might we magnify the Lord in this season? You know, what could we do to continue to worship, to praise him, to benefit our communities and our church? How can we more often set our affections on those things which are above? Turn the TV off, turn the news off for a moment, think about him, read the scriptures, pray, sing, think about the goodness of God in Christ Jesus, and how might we better receive the rest that the Lord offers in himself? Sometimes it's just a retuning, a refocusing, a resetting, because the rest has already been offered. Beloved, thank you for your time. Jesus is enough. Happy to send you a copy of the book if you want it. Teach your children that he's enough. It's going to be okay in him. And um, we will get through all of this together, perfectly in a way that honors and glorifies our Lord. Um, for us here at CRCC, we love you and appreciate you. And uh, here to help as much as we can. If you need us, give us a ring. If you're on YouTube from some other place and you want to drop something down in the comments, a uh, question or a note of encouragement, uh, happy to hear that too and read that and respond to you. Love you guys. See you soon. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for your people. Thank you for your, your provision. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that your son Jesus is enough. Thank you, Lord, that his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his coming back again. Uh, thank you for these truths. They give us peace. They give us joy. They help us to walk in victory. Uh, and to recognize, Lord, that you are sovereign over everything. Uh, Lord, everything that truly matters, you have given us. Everything that truly matters, you have given us. And you continue to provide our daily bread. And so we bless your name. Help us to communicate the gospel in this hour. Help us to continue to make disciples in this hour. Help us to continue to listen to preaching in this hour and to give in this hour. Help us, Lord, to do all the things that we're supposed to do because those things are still in place and have not been impacted at all. The stuff that really matters is still here. And so we bless you and we thank you. We pray that you heal bodies, that you touch minds, that you deliver us from the virus, that you give wisdom to our government officials, that you would not allow us to become sick, that you keep our bodies healthy, that you'd help us to recover. But as we recover with a mindset that has been renewed and refreshed, a mindset that'll give you reverence and honor that we may serve you acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We lift you up and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.